identity of the executor letter and the claim that the executor is a higher role than the trustee. Well, let me clear that up because, in fact, this has been an issue of talking apples to lemons, apples to oranges. If we were talking about a testamentary trust, a pure testamentary trust, a bit like me saying to one of you, I have a terminal disease, I'm about to die, uh, here is my list of property, my will, and when I die, will you execute that will? And you say yes. Then I have appointed you my executor, and when I die, I would hope and trust that you would then um, call after the funeral, after the wake, a reading of the will, and by reading of the will by the executor, the testamentary trust would be brought into life. And so you would uh, read and you would appoint the trustees. Uh, you would uh, read through the property and who would get to use different property uh, and the trust would be put into place. But that's a testamentary trust. That's not an artificial trust. That's not a Sester KV trust. So I think the confusion, because when you look at a dictionary and you see definitions of the office of executor, they do say the office of executor is the highest office. And when you go to the courts and you talk to people and they talk about trusts, then they see the office of executor being a higher role. So I think the confusion has been this. The nature and operation of Sester KVs is deliberately confused and certainly not well taught. The knowledge of testamentary trusts is okay and people can glean those facts. But we've been talking two entirely different things. Now, if one seeks to interpret how sister KVs work by applying knowledge of testamentary trusts, then in the short term, considering the courts themselves are ignorant, there may be some remedy. Because there certainly has been evidence in the use of the executive letter that people have actually got remedy. Court uh, cases have been quashed, um, the records have been expunged, people have achieved remedy. But this is not remedy based on deep knowledge, this is remedy based on the fact that the courts themselves are more ignorant than we are. But that is a temporary situation, not a permanent situation. And if one is to look to a long-term situation based on competence and not a short window of opportunity, we must apply rules and knowledge that we have of Sester KV and not continue to be confused in the differences between testamentary and Sester KV. So I want to pay homage to those that have persisted with the executor because it has helped us and it certainly helped myself in become much, much clearer as to why these differences have arisen. But now knowing that the office of executor being hired in the trustee only applies when we're looking at testamentary and not to artificial, it would be foolish, I think, to keep trying to apply the executor understanding to SESTA KV where in fact the trustee is the highest and most powerful role in Sester KV. So I hope that clears a little bit up in terms of some of the confusion where people themselves have done research and it still has not seemed to, to fit. So there you go. There's been a, a miscommunication there. So we are talking about Sester KV. Now with Sester KV, we have three roles that we, we need to be clear on. And these three roles have not been clear and I want to try and clear that up once and for all in the talk show. And from this point on, we will follow through on these understandings. That is, who is in fact the trustee? Who is the administrator? Who is the executor in Sester KV? Well, we know and we've gone back through and we've asked the questions and feedback has come from a number of you and I really appreciate this when we look at the court, that the original thinking in terms of thinking that the judge may be holding the role of the trustee and may in fact even be reserving the role of the executor was misplaced. The judge is, to all intents and purposes, fulfilling the role of the administrator. And a number of you actually gave evidence to that fact from your own experience 
where people have been able to uh, give back um, their experience where they've gone into court and said things like, I'm the administrator, and the judge has said, no, I'm the administrator. Or a number of you have had experiences where the judge has offered even just the fact that they claim only to be the facilitator and therefore the administrator. So rather than the judge being the trustee, as we had previously been discussing, it is more accurate to see under the SESTA KV in the function of these uh, trusts that the judge only performs the role of administrator and nothing more. Well, who then is the executor? Understanding more about what the executor is and does has also been most useful. The executor is executing. The executor is effectively holding the surety. The executor is effectively uh, guaranteeing certain performance. Well, if you think about it, the person that first brings the executor type role into a matter against us is the prosecutor. They're the one that is holding the surety to begin with. And it makes sense then why a, a prosecutor holds a checkbook, because if they can't lo load us up with the uh, surety, then they hold the surety and they're the ones that have to ultimately pay out the penalty. So it is the, exec the, the prosecutor that when the case begins that is fulfilling the role of the executor. And at the end of the case, what they're trying to do is to get us to do two things. One is beneficiary, accept the benefit. And secondly, for us to sign, which is to execute, or through silence agree, but ultimately to execute by a, a signature, an agreement that we will also be the executor. Consequently, it makes perfect sense when we've heard over time that prisons are full of executives performing their administration of the trust. So if the prosecutor then is the executor, and we're now clear on that, and I thank many of you who have helped in the last week in, in helping us refine this and learn, not just simply take a position and, and, and say to hell with it, but learn and, and, and grow our information. And if the judges are in fact the administrators, and again, I thank you all for your contribution in making that much, much clearer for us. Who is the trustee? Well, what do we know that a trustee does? If we're looking for someone that is the trustee, then we want to look for someone that is performing accounting functions, someone that is issuing documents, handling documents, conveying property, uh, administering the trust in those matters. And do you know someone that is sitting in the court and prior to the court is uh, loading up uh, charges against the account and uh, is performing paperwork and issuing paperwork and conveying certain administrative functions. I think I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of you would know that role. It's, it's in fact the only role in the court, being an oratory, that has an ecclesiastical title. It is the cleric. Well, we know is the clerk. He or she is not a secretary. He or she is an ecclesiastical officer. So when we go to court, they get us to focus on the judge. The judge doesn't have the power. It's the trustee that has the power and says the KV. And now we see that the, it is, in fact, the cleric, the clerk, that is the key role that we need to address our deed pile to and we need to hold to account when the SESTA KVs are not collapsed. Well, this is good. This is good news because effectively when they open a case against us, in that process, the role of the trustee must be converted to the clerk of the courts uh, in the particular jurisdiction that they are pursuing us for. So it means that if we are able to give notice through a return of the summons or the hearing notice or the order or whatever is issued by the clerk, back to the, on the back of that, then the deed poll to that clerk, then we can start the process of holding the, that clerk as the trustee of the SESTA KV Trust to account as to why they refuse under fiduciary duties to collapse these trusts. We can't collapse them. All we can do is expose their fraud. The purpose of the deed poll is simply that, to allow them to place themselves in dishonour, to expose the fraud. Now, when you go on to 
uh, one dash heaven. That's O N E dash heaven dot org, and you have a look at the um, Article one three three of the Ecclesiastical Deed Poll. Then you'll see the listing of the deed poll there under the uh, Articles of Canon Law. And when you read it, the purpose of that is to show them that all the presumptions by which a SESTA KV is put in place, being lost, abandoned, dead, minor or incompetent, have all been exposed as fraud when we return them a deed poll on the back of one of their notices. But we can't physically ourselves collapse those trusts. So in a moment, we'll be talking about the, the kind of 100-day steps and, and remedy that we want to pursue in absolutely nailing these clerks. So now we know who we need to address our material to. It's a double-edged sword power. We've spoken about this before. If they want to pursue us, they want to imprison us, they have to give the clerk some power. They can't switch it around. If the docket's open, the docket's open. If the case is open, the case is open. The clerk is administering until the case is closed. So we know who now we need to direct our deed polls to. Now let me switch a bit to talk about more evidence on the machinery of SESTA KV and the nature of money and the nature of what we're pursuing. And it's directly relevant for this, this issue. I've spoken about the Unum Sanctum as the first express trust and one can go and have a look at it and read it and see it when one looks at the nature of trust that it is in fact a trust claiming the property of the world and one can go and have a look at those three paper bulls Pontifex Romanus um, uh, a Roman, a Roman pontiff as well as the um, second one attorney regis and the third one convocation and see that there are key elements there that give you the indication of them being uh, testamentary trust. But I know it is extremely hard for people, even if you've been investigating this for years, to get your head around the concept that these people are actually trying to claim ownership of our souls as well as our flesh in slavery. Because when you grow up in a, a country like Australia or England, Canada, America or anywhere in the world, you're taught that slavery was abolished. And that if it still continues, it continues in spite of the free will and democracy. So to consider that the basic structure by which the entire financial system operates is based on slavery and sorcery seems absurd. Certainly it makes it extremely hard to talk to a friend or relative when you say, well, what, you know, you want to talk about something and you make these claims, they think you're mad. So let me give you some cold, hard evidence from way back in 1540 that this structure has been there for a long, long time and is hidden in plain sight. Well, a number of you may have heard of the uh, temple, the Temple Bar located in the uh, city of London, the old city of London. Uh, it's a roundish building there, sitting there in the middle of uh, the courts and surrounded by the inns, and is the origin of the bar. When we talk about the bar, we're talking about the temple bar and the inns, from which we see the origins of the lawyers, uh, the clerics, and the legal system we're dealing with now. That's their spiritual home. Now, an interesting thing happened in 1540 with this particular uh, place. The Temple Bar formed what they call its uh, rules and orders, orders and rules. And in those orders and rules, when they met, they held parliament. And when they sat down, they sat on benches. And when parliament was opened, an event was opened, it was opened by a white rod, as, a, as opposed to a black rod at Westminster. And in their rules and orders, they give rules and orders effectively the same as uh, a parliament, a government um, that we would normally see um, rule a country. Now, another extraordinary thing happened. The land of the temple was given to them absolute. 
not fee simple absolute, absolute. 